Welcome, everyone. This is another episode of Trek Wars at OSU, that's Oregon State University. I'm Dr. Joseph Orozco. I'm a professor of philosophy at Oregon State University, and I'm the co-director of the Inares Project for Alternative Futures. Today on Trek Wars at OSU, a discussion about collective trauma and the Star Trek universe. Now, collective trauma and grieving, these subjects have become very popular to talk about in activist circles uh, most recently. So I'm thinking of particular works like Cindy Milstein's Rebellious Morning, The Collective Work of Grief, uh, the work also of Carla Bergman and Nick Montgomery in their book Joyful Militancy, Thriving Resistance uh, in Toxic Times, uh, the work also of uh, Adrienne Marie Brown. There's been a lot of discussion about thinking about self-care in activist circles and how we might process our feelings and dealing with that as ways of trying to make sure that our work and social justice and, 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 and activism is positive in a way that empowers us to do the kind of work that we do and, and deals with the kinds of problems of toxicity in activist circles and also in the greater society that we live in. So, my guest today is someone who has thought about the work of collective trauma in the Star Trek universe. Uh, she goes by the handle of Captain Pikachu, and I'm very uh, uh, honored that she is here to join us uh, today for Trek Wars at OSU to talk about collective trauma in the Kelvin universe in particular, the trilogy of films by J.J. Abrams starting in 2009. So, uh, Captain, thank you for being here. Glad to be here. <laughs> so uh, what I always do when I begin talking with folks uh, uh, about Star Trek is uh, I, I like to know a little bit about their their personal story in the fandom. Star Trek fans always have some kind of story about wh what's brought them to Star Trek. So you're known by the handle Captain Pikachu. You're quite active in the <laughs> Star Trek Twitterverse. Uh, you're clearly a devoted Star Trek fan. Some You have some of the most interesting commentary, I think, in the Star Trek Twitterverse. So uh, I, I wanted to know, how did you first become interested in Star Trek? What's your what's your personal story bringing you to the fandom? Well, I started Star Trek when I was nine. I had just come to the U.S. Um, and I was flipping through channels on TV and I found UPN and Star Trek Voyager happened to be on at the time. I believe it was towards the end of Voyager's run, but at the time, it, it might have also been reruns, I don't really know. But I remember I caught a few episodes and I thought, oh, this, this looks interesting. I, I like space, they're on a spaceship. <laughs> this looks kind of cool. <laughs> and she, they've got a female captain. I thought, oh, wow, that, she reminds me of my mom. <laughs> so uh, I thought, oh, I'll watch this, this looks fun. And so I kept up with some of it. And then I heard eventually there was another show that they were doing Star Trek Enterprise and so that became my Star Trek show that I watched from the moment it was airing until it went off the air and it was kind of strange because I think for me Voyager even though it was the first thing I watched I didn't really think of it as sort of my Star Trek show mostly because I think I missed most of it while it was on the air and it was sort of out of order, so I didn't really get a sense of the story from beginning to end. But with Enterprise, I got to be there at the beginning, I got to be there at the end. So that was always my Star Trek show and the one that I really felt connected to the most. And mostly because, you know, that was a story about the first explorers, the first people that went out into space and did this big, huge adventure and everything was new to them and everything was sort of this strange new life that they've never seen before. And that really connected with me because I was just a little kid who had just come to a new country, learning a new language, meeting new people. So it felt like they were on the same journey that I was on. So when they went out into the world and sort of didn't know what to do, I was like, well, I know exactly how that feels. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly how I felt when I went off to school and you know when when Hoshi's trying to figure out how to communicate to somebody in a new language and I was like I know exactly what that feels like 
that's exactly how I feel when I'm trying to figure out how English works. That's, so that's yeah, that for me, <laughs> that for me was pretty much the big connection between me and Enterprise. And it, it just felt like it was the show that I needed it at the time mm. to feel like, okay, somebody at least gets the feelings <laughs> that I was feeling. And when they were having issues, I was like, oh, I, I understand how those things feel. And so I really connected with that story and those characters. And I started watching all these, uh, all the other Star Trek shows and sort of finding whatever episodes and reruns that I could get my hands on. So around that time, I probably seen all the Star Trek shows, but to be quite honest, I can't remember most of them. I think they were, I watched them out of order so long ago that I just have like no memory of most of it, which is why I recently uh, started doing a rewatch from the beginning to the end. I was like, I am going to keep everything in chronological order <laughs> and remember what's going on. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of, it, 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 Enterprise was really what got me into Star Trek. And when it went off the air, I was really quite sad. Mm. And then I got back into Star Trek again when uh, Star Trek 2009 came and I was like, oh, cool. They, they, they've got Star Trek on the big screen. This is really exciting. Um, so that really got me back into doing more Star Trek things. And then in the recent years, it was, um, I hadn't really, I wasn't really watching Discovery when it first came out because I was like, oh, there's a new Star Trek show, but I'm going to wait till it finishes so I can just watch the whole thing and binge it and not have to wait between years. And then uh, I heard at the end of season one, I, there, there was, you know, I follow a lot of entertainment news. And so all the stuff about, oh, they met up with the Enterprise and Captain Pike might be coming back. And I was like, wait, hold on. <laughs> What's going to happen? <laughs> and as you can probably tell by my shirt, <laughs> Captain Pike is my favorite character in all of Star Trek. So as soon as I heard that they were going to bring him back into Star Trek, I was like, okay, well then I, I got to hurry up and watch the show so I can well, prepare you know, for season two. <laughs> he is the most uh, highly decorated captain in, in Starfleet, right? So it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, I yeah, want to ask I mean... you about this. Like, what's the back, what's the backstory for your handle? Like, why Captain Pikachu? It, it was funny because um, in the middle of watching season two, um, Detective Pikachu, I think, was coming out. And I, I found myself looking at, um, I was always talking about like Ansem Mount as an actor is very expressive. And so there were certain faces that making, whether it was in the background of a shot or in certain scenes, it just it reminded me of Detective Pikachu. And so I went and found side-by-side -side, uh, photo comparisons. <laughs> it just looked like they were the exact same person. <laughs> so I was like, oh, uh, like, like a Pikachu. And so I thought Pikachu, Pikachu <laughs> sounds <laughs> like the same thing. So this sort of became uh, my Twitter handle at some time last year. <laughs> I was convinced that he was... A Pikachu. If they would go to a planet and find a Pikachu and he could meet a Pikachu, it would be great. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, let's um, uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, 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 that's a great story about your connection. Um, I want to talk about your article, which I, I really found fascinating when I looked at it. So you've written this article that came out on trekfirst.com, which we'll make, uh, we'll make a link to uh, for viewers. But part of what you do in this is you look at the, the three Kelvin Universe films starting in 2009, uh, and you talk about the theme of collective trauma that runs through all of them. So uh, you say that the idea of collective trauma is something that runs through all of them and then in some sense grounds all of the Kelvin timeline films and gives it a kind of substance that, you know, quite, quite frankly, I was really impressed to see. Um, when I first saw the, the Kelvin films, I, I was not particularly impressed with a lot of them, but I've been reading a lot of different analyses and yours in particular 
really resonated with me and made me think, oh, you know, there's a lot more here than I've given credit to. I still don't know if I like Into Darkness, but I appreciate the <laughs> analysis that you give. So I was wondering if you could help us to understand a little bit about what you what you saw in these films. Could you explain a little bit about what you mean by the idea of collective trauma? What, what, exactly, what exactly does that experience mean to you? Well, I think for me personally, the probably the biggest example I would think of collective trauma in my lifetime would be an event like 9-11. Um, I was very young when it happened, but I do remember the event and I do remember the planes going into the tower because uh, I was, the news was on in my classroom. So we were watching the second plane hit the tower. And, and so I, I remember this is this big event that happens that I think it affects everybody in varying different levels, but it's this big event this big huge trauma that's really affected everyone and has affected every way that our government operates. So that 9-11 sort of overtone was always the thing that became very immediately clear to me, even just from watching uh, the 2009 Star Trek film, because you know, the, the Kelvin timeline is essentially this universe that was born out of a traumatic event because uh, they went back in time, but Nero wouldn't have gone back if Romulus wasn't destroyed. So that big traumatic event in the prime timeline is what kicks off Nero wanting, ending up back in time and chasing after Spock and this whole thing about him being rageful of what happened to his planet is sort of the catalyst for everything that comes after. So this universe, first of all, wouldn't even exist if Romulus wasn't destroyed. And so I always felt like from the very beginning, this huge collective event that devastated a species really and affected the power dynamics of an entire universe is the reason that this other universe basically exists. From the first moment that Nero crosses into that universe and runs into the USS Calvin, that's another huge traumatic event that happens. I mean, like I always say the first 10 minutes of 2009 Star Trek is probably one of the best and also the most traumatic opening shot I think of any Star Trek story because it just puts you in the middle of this big huge devastating event where our protagonist James T. Kirk is born and so when you look at it from that way every single one of their lives is sort of touched by this trauma that's kind of transferred from person to person and Kirk himself is born out of a traumatic event and his father's death is sort of this big thing that hangs over his entire life, really. And so when I look at the Kelvin universe, it, that's kind of where it starts. It's this big traumatic event. And there's multiple sort of traumatic events flowing into each other that forms the background of this universe that um, these stories exist in. No, good. Thank you. I, I think that that's right. And so, so there's this the the storyline, and, and you know, right. And it has all the we see, particularly for instance, like in in Star Trek Picard, how that this traumatic event still has all these kinds of uh, reverberations. And right as you write in your article, you, you you're calling uh, collective trauma as the kind of traumatic experience that affects different collectivities and affecting their their emotions, their development, and social political policies. Right, you see that at least going on in Star Trek Picard, the way in which this the destruction of, of Romulus has affected the Federation and shaken it up in a way that makes it almost unrecognizable for Picard. Um, but uh, getting back to 2009 Star Trek, right? So it's the backdrop for the story. But what I found really uh, interesting about your work is how you explain that the storyline itself, particularly the stories of, of Kirk, Spock, and Nero, in that all show different kinds of ways of responding to collective trauma. 
and show successful ways and not so successful ways of dealing with trauma. So you, you've mentioned uh, uh, Nero and, and Kirk so far as being born, so to speak, as characters in this. Um, could you talk about the, these three different trajectories, the, the Kirk, Spock, Nero stories in 2009, uh, uh, Star Trek to sort of talk about what are the ways in which they differently respond to this enormous grief that they're experiencing? Yeah, um, for Nero, I think, you know, it's just, it's a lot of anger. Um, I would call him as sort of the negative response to a traumatic event. And I think it's often the one that uh, we as human beings tend to go towards uh, the easiest because, you know, being angry, I think it's easier than figuring out how to deal with it in a more a productive and positive way. Um, anger usually comes quite easily and it usually comes first. But I think with Nero, the issue was that he kept holding onto it. Um, this big, huge traumatic event that's happened in his life, which he understandably responds in a very angry way. But it, instead of, you know, in the 20 years that he was waiting, in the Kelvin universe uh, to meet up with Spock when he comes out of the wormhole, you know, he could have said, okay, let's go around and figure out what we can do for Romulus in the future. You know, that's one of those things that he could have been thinking of doing, but he was so angry and he was so holding on to this feeling of, I wanna get revenge, I wanna, you know, get back at somebody, uh, ultimately, whatever his intention was, oh, I want to save Romulus, I want to save my planet, it became more of a personal vendetta than it was ultimately about protecting his planet or, or you know, even his wife or future daughter or future version of him because he was essentially just, I wanted to go get revenge when he could have really done something to help his planet in a sense. And I think with Kirk and with Spock, you see a way where I think especially with Kirk, he also responds um, in a sense in a very angry way at the beginning because he's this loud, brash, you know, arrogant, very personal focused person. But in throughout the story, he comes to understand about you know trusting other people working with other people and being less self-focused and more focused about other people and i think that's one of the things that i always felt like um despite the fact that the calvin timeline kirk and the prime timeline kirk have a lot of differences uh, one of the things that they both have is this capacity to listen to people and I think that's very much in the core of this character. And because I think Kirk has that ability to listen to people, he's able to take in the things that other people tell him and find a way to go forward in a way that's very productive. Because um, at the beginning, you know, he's this angry little kid sort of acting out and doing all sorts of things, which is understandable because, you know, his mother's not around. Um, his uncle or stepfather is angry and probably abusive, but he's this kid who's kind of trying to figure out where he wants to be and who he wants to be. And so he's kind of just, he's a little bit lost like Nero is, but he finds in himself and through other people, this sort of uh, guidance that, and because he listens to that guidance, he, grows and becomes a different person. And he moves in his life um, in a very productive way where he helps others, he learns from the past, um, and uses that knowledge of the past and that trauma to help other people because he remembers, oh, this thing happened on the day that I was born. We can go, this is a trap. And I, and I think, you know, with Kirk, we see the ways that our trauma and our traumatic experiences can be used 
productively to help other people. And I think, uh, you know, Kirk exemplifies that a lot. And with Spock, you know, the destruction of Vulcan, you know, with both Spocks <laughs> in a way, um, uh, but with the younger Spock, I think, again, we see that reaction is anger, you know, first of all, and, it, and with his anger, it was kind of buried deep until Kirk made it come out, but it's that anger that we go to first. But then he also, through listening to his father, realizes that, you know, these, these emotions, you know, what, that, that they're, they exist and they're real and you have to learn to deal with it and you have to focus on the problem at hand and work with other people. So I think we see in both Kirk and Spock um, that one of the ways that we can deal with traumatic events is find other people who can understand them and also listen to other people uh, who can give you guidance. You know, I, I think we can all understand that feeling of anger when something bad happens, but how you deal with that anger is ultimately kind of determines who you are. And I think with Spock and with Kirk, you see that they found a sort of new strength with each other that they couldn't have found if they were standing alone. And I think that's one of the things that uh, prime older Spock shows to Kirk and sort of teaches Kirk that, you know, you need each other uh, to get through this event. And you can't do that if you're always just focused on yourself and thinking about your anger and not working together for whatever other purpose and goal that you get to. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. I mean, uh, what what I just realized too in, in two thousand nine Star Trek, right, is that both Kirk and Spock are initially guided to this path that you're talking about of being receptive by these kinds of uh, um, father figures, right? Literally for 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 Spock, right? Sarek, there's that crucial scene, right, where Sarek tells mm -hmm. him to to pay attention to his emotions and to deal with them. Uh, but then, of course, right. Uh, your favorite Captain Pike, right, uh, takes uh, Jim Kirk under his wing, gets him into Starfleet, and then puts him into the community of people that he can then begin to trust and and to learn from in these kinds of ways. So it's this kind of initial push by these kinds of representative father figures that get uh, both of those characters to start listening to their emotions in order to deal with their trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Interesting, really cool. Um, part of what uh, I wanted to get to was this question, right? Um, so 2013 comes along and we have Star Trek Into Darkness. Now, when you analyze this one, you the dimension that you focus here is about the ways in which traumatic events can start to corrupt our political institutions uh, and affect our leaders uh, to become corrupt in various ways. And so really a, a relevant topic, I think, <laughs> uh, especially after 9-11 in so many different kinds of ways. But right, uh, Star Trek Into Darkness does begin again with a, a terrorist attack right, on, on, on the Federation. And so that leads to a lot of different other kinds of events. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the ways in which you see collective trauma as affecting political institutions and the ways in which leaders respond to the kind of fear and uh, uh, anger that collective trauma produces. Yeah, so with In the Darkness, it was very interesting to see them uh, delve into the fact that Starfleet, because of the world that they exist in, the attack on the Kelvin and what happened at Vulcan and the fact that, you know, <laughs> Starfleet lost an entire graduating class, basically, in those ships at Vulcan, that their response to it is to start militarizing Starfleet in a way. And I think, Pike mentions it even so um, in 2009 as well, that Starfleet has uh, lost that instinct to leap without looking. And, you know, one of the things I think that defined the prime timeline is that there's 
it's always just this optimism and this curiosity of I'm going to leap out into the world and whatever comes, it comes. And I think with the Kelvin timeline, especially because of the attack on the Kelvin and sort of everything that follows, there's a lot of that hesitancy, um, a, a lot of wariness about how they approach the rest of the galaxy. And one of the things, you know, I always felt like was representative of that was uh, people always bring up the comparison that the Kelvin timeline enterprise is exceedingly much larger than the prime timeline enterprise. And I always felt like, I don't know if the uh, writers made that a deliberate choice or, you know, because it's a film, but I always felt like that represented a sort of response that the Kelvin timeline was having that they need ships they needed more firepower because they were floating out in the universe and doing their own little fun research stuff and here comes this giant ship comes out of nowhere kills off almost an entire crew and so their response is we got to make our ships bigger we got to have more firepower we want to contend with what's out there in the universe and i think that militarization is very much uh personified in Admiral Marcus because he he looks at Starfleet as we can't be just peaceful and looks at the world because clearly the world is out there and it's gonna come back and get us Vulcan we've lost you know the Kelvin and all these things we've lost an entire graduating class their response to logically to him is we got to defend ourselves um and I think that's not something that is reached until I think um, around DS9 and the Dominion Wars later on uh, in the prime time and so they get there a lot later but because of these sort of big events that happen in the Kelvin timeline they reach that point a lot quicker because you know it, it seems logical that the response of someone attacking you is that you defend yourself and become more wary of the threats that are out there. Um, but I think that's the slippery slope. You know, that's kind of where you start. The, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And, you know, I, I don't think you can say that Admiral Marcus didn't have good intentions on wanting to protect Starfleet and its way of life. But I also think that because he saw that, he, because he was convinced that a war was going to happen, he inevitably was making a self-fulfilling prophecy by going out there and having militarized Starfleet and preemptively attacking other people. You know, he was making that war happen and thus uh, destroying their way of life <laughs> in the process. And, and I think it's very easy for institutions and leaders in that sort of environment and in that state of fear to forget the larger picture and the larger goal because they're once again focused on the self. You know, what is, how do I protect what's mine? How do I protect me and my people? And they're really not thinking of uh, values that they should be upholding because it's easier to you know, go punch somebody in the face and it is to say, okay, let's take a step back and think about a way that we can resolve things in a more peaceful way. You know, it, it, it's, it's between uh, doing what's right and doing what's easy. And I think what's easy is always going to be, you know, I'm going to make a bigger ship and I'm going to go attack somebody because yeah. that's the proper, that, that's sort of the logical uh, response you know, if somebody hurts you, you hurt them back. Right. And yeah, and so I think it's kind of hard. And, and Khan himself uh, in this story is both um, a victim of that, mm -hmm. the militarization and that mentality, but he's also an extension of it because he comes from that time period and that world still, uh, same as the prime timeline Khan, of, you know, might might is right <laughs> and that's that mentality that he has too <laughs>
Yeah, you know, uh, I, the way that you present this, I mean, I see Admiral Marcus as sort of following in the long tradition of a lot of these Starfleet admirals <laughs> when we when we yeah. see, see them responding to security threats. And so in some ways, right, I know a lot of people are always talking about how the Kelvin timeline is uh, shouldn't be considered Trek because the stories just go far off. But at least in the portrayal of, of the admirals, this is pretty consistent because, for instance, in DS9, you constantly see the admirals responding with greater security and 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 uh, militarization of threats like in the Dominion War. We see this in Discovery too, right? At the end of the Klingon War when uh, there's the plan to commit genocide on, on, on uh, Kronos in order to take care of the, the, the Klingon threat to Earth, right? There's always this tendency to think that when there's this existential threat, we have to respond with overwhelming violence rather than, as you say, trying to figure out are there other ways in which we can resolve conflict? But that, so what you see coming out of right into darkness is this kind of reflection on the ways in which collective trauma can really push us into uh, a response situation. And one of the easy sort of places to go is to think about responding with violence and overwhelming uh, force in order to deal with the situation. But you think in the end that, uh, that what Into Darkness does is it shows that that response is too easy and that there's a different kind of response that we can make to collective trauma. Um, what's the different response that, uh, that Kirk and, and the Enterprise present to Marcus? I think their response is in what Kirk ends up doing is um, he doesn't blow up. Kronos. He instead lands on the planet, brings in Khan, and arrests him, basically. <laughs> and and I think the way that he dealt with it, especially at the beginning, you know, he was kind of trying to push everybody away. And he was kind of doing the things that, you know, Marcus is likely doing. And, and in that very way that he was manipulating Kirk into doing, because knowing that Pike died and everything that was following those feelings would drive him to not want to listen to anybody else and sort of just focus on the sort of uh, Nero-like mindset uh, where he's just going to go and attack and get that revenge because he's angry. But I, I think, again, you know, the capacity to listen to people is something that Kirk has and he he does you know try his best to not listen to everybody around him but inevitably you know he he does actually listen you know he he thinks about what people are presenting to him you know scotty sort of calls him out you know we we i made this trans warp you know calculation thing and now some madman is kind of using it to hop across the galaxy you know I thought we were explorers, not soldiers. This is a military operation. And Spock is, you know, constantly questioning him. And well, what about our regulations? What about this? What about this? So I, I think, you know, the important thing of dealing with this sort of issue, and I think the way that Kirk presents is that you have to listen to the people around you in a way. Um, you have to listen to the people who are the angels on your shoulder rather than the devils on your shoulder and think, well, maybe there is another way we can do this. Maybe there's a way we, we don't end up in a war and there's a way we can resolve things in a peaceful manner. And I think he's also reminded in a sense that, you know, what would Pike do? You know, his sort of guiding father figure, what would he be doing in that same position. And I think because of that ability to listen, Kirk finds another way where we're going to arrest him and we're just going to bring him back to the Federation. And, you know, whether he goes on trial or he becomes a prisoner, you know, that's a decision that has to be done with transparency and that everybody else has to come to an agreement with. And I think that's the way that Kirk figures out through the help of other people. And it's something that we see Marcus just kind of flat out rejects. And because like Nero, he's very single-minded of just, this is what I say so. And because I say so, this is what's going to happen. And 
he doesn't want to listen. And inevitably, like Nero, that inability to listen and to adapt and change is inevitably what gets him killed. Because, you know, he brings out Khan and Khan's anger, again, just kind of goes, you know, stings roll right through them. And I think it's just, it's another sign of this is why anger <laughs> at the end of the day in, you know, in the way that Star Trek presents is that that doesn't work. That's not the long-term solution. It might solve your short-term problems, but inevitably, if you want to build something that's long and lasting, you can't do it through violence and through anger. It's never going to sustain. What works is you know, peace and compassion and unity, that's the only way a civilization survives is not certainly not through, you know, being angry at people <laughs> and not getting along. Yeah, I like that, right? So the, the answer is, right, the, the, the solution to collective trauma is collective solidarity, right? This kind of unity that mm -hmm. you're talking to, right? Not the emotional response of anger, hatred, frustration. Um, you mentioned before, right at the beginning, that, that your real big uh, Star Trek <laughs> love at the initial was Enterprise, right? And of course, yeah. right, uh, this uh, Enterprise comes out almost immediately after the trauma of 9-11, and its second season storyline is the long arc of the Zindi War, right? Uh, yeah. It, and was very self-consciously trying to sort of capture the mood of the United States at the time uh, by presenting a, a kind of an existential attack on, on, on Earth by the Zindi, who believed that they were, you know, in an existential threat from, uh, from Earth. <laughs> Uh, uh, that sort of storyline went there. And this has always been a very controversial kind of storyline, not only for the politics, but also just for the, within the, the Enterprise storyline. Some people feel that the storyline was kind of weak in various ways. Um, I, I wonder, did, is your analysis of Star Trek Into Darkness similar to what's going on with Enterprise and the Zindi War? Have we heard this kind of story before going on in Star Trek and particularly in Enterprise? I think, yeah, I mean, you can definitely make the comparison that uh, the Zindi War arc is in itself um, very much like Into Darkness and sort of this uh, story that's in the Kelvin timeline. Because I, I think much like the Kelvin films and Enterprise, they're both sort of reactions to the fallout of 9-11, which you know, in many ways we are still feeling to this day and it's really never gone away. And Enterprise, I think it's definitely the one that started it because it's, you know, the closest the one to the event that happened. And I think personally for me, it was also the story arc that um, made, gave me some perspective in the real world because I was quite young when the event happened. So emotionally I was sort of disconnected uh, from the event. And I think uh, the story in Enterprise gave me sort of an emotional connection of, okay, now I understand sort of this collective trauma and grief that was happening in the world at the time and how people would be feeling. Um, and the interesting thing, though, is uh, I think in a way, um, in, in Enterprise sort of touched on the same sort of uh, slippery slope of our values being lost in the same way that Inter Into Darkness does, but obviously in a <laughs> more extended period in 24 episodes, as opposed to a film. Uh, but I think it's interesting in the sense that because it's not necessarily, I think, a talk about institutions so much, because at the time, I think Starfleet wasn't really this big picture in Enterprise. And Archer was kind of very much on his own. But I think Archer's sort of slight descent into this darker version of himself is that, you know, Admiral Marcus sort of parallel. And, but I think it ultimately, I think Enterprise goes a slight step further than Into Darkness was able to do. Um, I, just because I think of the formats of the different stories that they were telling, that uh, in in the end you do see that Archer, uh, much like Kirk, he finds a way to listen to people and listen to the values that Starfleet is supposed to sort of stand for, and 
and he finds a way through communicating with the people on the other side of the Zindi to sort of form this alliance of let's find another way of dealing with this threat. And, and it's interesting because I, I think with uh, the people on the Zindi side, you also see them. And I think that's the, the thing that Into Darkness is, doesn't have is that you see the people on the Zindi side also questioning what they're doing and wondering, well, is this right? Is this what we're supposed to do? There are millions of people that are dead. And I, and I think that's the really interesting part is that it, often in these kinds of stories, we don't really get the other side. You know, the other side is sort of this, you know, vague, all sort of homogenous, um, you know, evil entity that's come and attack us. But I think what Enterprise ends up doing is that it humanizes the other side to us and say, you know what, maybe the other side has a reason for what they do and maybe what they do isn't right, but there are also people in uh, that side that recognizes, wait, this doesn't feel right. And that in a way you can work with each other to find another way out of it, which is what they eventually do is that Archer works with people within the Zindi and they find another way to deal with the threat that ends up coming towards them. And I think that's uh, the part that Into Darkness doesn't have because ultimately with both Khan and Marcus, they were sort of quite set in their ways. Uh, but I think Enterprise was able to explore a bit more and make us see the Zindi in a different way that they're not just this, you know, vague entity of evil that comes and attacks us, but you also see that they have their own sort of humanity and their own reasons for doing the things that they do. And, you know, I. I and I think Tripp's arc in that story about how he feels about the death of his sister and how that relates to him and how he feels about the Zindi, it's something that, you know, it's just, it's very interesting when you look at that character's story and how they both sort of learn to let go of a degree of that anger and listen and reach out to the people on the other side and say, we can fix this. We can make sure something like this doesn't happen. And, and and I think that's a really important story to be told. And I, I think that's maybe why it was sort of controversial at the time to be addressing the fact that, you know, you want to make peace with the enemy, you know, so to speak. And, and I think that would have likely have been unfathomable, you know, two years off from this big event that happened. But I think it's also what part of what makes Star Trek kind of always slightly ahead of its time is that it does tell us, let's find a peaceful way to deal with things that are horrible and we can find a different sort of way to move forward. Yeah, no, I like how you say that because it just makes me think that this is one of the, the strategies of Star Trek in terms of thinking about <laughs> conflict and thinking about danger. It's, it's always trying to, it presents at the beginning usually in a lot, so many different episodes as kind of uh, a monster figure or some kind of danger. And then through the process of the episode, right, the, there's a learning in which the enemy is learned to be much more complex, has its own motivations. And in learning that, you start to see the enemy in a different kind of way. I'm thinking, for instance, like, uh, you know, like the Horda in, in yeah. the original series, right? This thing that this monster going around is killing all these people. And you learn that it's just a mother protecting its young. I'm thinking of like the Gorn uh, in Star Trek original series too, right? That it was uh, rather than being invaders, they were just defending themselves against a perceived threat. And so, uh, you know, you can just go on and on and on that throw many different series. There's this kind of tendency of Star Trek to teach us that we shouldn't just pay attention to the surface of people who we think are our threats but as you say by reaching out by looking at a bigger context by listening you can process that anger you can start to look ahead to a different kind of relationship with those that you call your enemy um, this brings me actually to um, the the third film the final film so far that we've seen in the the Abrams um, Kelvin timeline right uh, Star Trek Beyond 
And here, this, this is actually my favorite part of the article where you talk about the ways in which uh, collective trauma can uh, affect our sense of our, sel our self-identity, of who we think we are in the face of this traumatic event. And what you write is that in Beyond, what you see is a struggle of characters to deal with their loss of identity, the loss of the meaning of their life, to try to look forward to how they might be different kinds of people. And that uh, in Beyond, you see, right, Crawl uh, learning, right, initially presented again as this enemy comes out to be a, a wounded person trying to figure out who they are and struggles very much to try to uh, give up that pain, but that ultimately that pain and that trauma traps him in a certain kind of way of being. And that Star Trek is trying to teach us a little bit about the, the need to imagine a different kind of future in the face of traumatic events. So uh, this is something that, of course, we, we, we talk a lot about here on this channel, right? This kind of question about what does it mean to imagine different kinds of futures? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the, the ways in which self-identity and collective trauma are dealt with in Star Trek Beyond from 2016? I think it has to start with Crawl because he's so attached to this identity of the past and this inability to let go of that past and that feeling of pain and abandonment um, and, and again, you know, not wanting to break bread with the enemy, you know, which he mentions in the film. And, and I think that's where his big issue is, is that he doesn't want to let it go. And he's afraid of letting it go because it means a different future. It means something else. It means to him weakness and not surviving. And so he ties his identity to survival in a sense. Uh, he thinks that the way he survives and being strong is by holding on to this pain and this past and this identity and this mentality about, you know, struggle is what makes them strong. And that this unity is just, you know, you just, you're just papering over the cracks uh, and it's not real because people can't get along you know that's kind of what he's trying to get at because he's been through so many you know the the Zindi and the Romulan wars he just can't accept that there can be a future where you know there's peace and things are different and it's interesting to compare him because uh him and Kirk are pretty much mirrors you know it's, it's this darker reflection of who Kirk could be if he lets himself uh, be trapped by this feeling of, you know, it, it, everything's become episodic and it's tiring. And do I really want to go out and in there into the stars? Is this what I want to do with my life? And again, you know, it, it, it shows that Kirk's adaptability and his ability to listen is again, his <laughs> best trait because he's able to have the self-awareness to recognize that his past, uh, his past does define him in a way and his past does affect him, but his past is also not what controls him. You know, there is a future out there for him and his crew that's not di dictated or predetermined by whatever happens in the past. You know, he, he has that line when he fights with Crawl, where he says, uh, where, you know, Crawl says, you know, he, you know, he was born into what he was not, like, peace wasn't what he was born into. And, and Kirk answers that with saving lives is what he was born into. And in, in a way, you know, peace is not what Kirk was born into either. You know, when he was born, literally, there was a ship blowing up, everybody was escaping, it was just, huge you know devastating attack so he was not born into peace and his life has certainly not been you know untouched by violence uh, i think the important thing is kirk uh he was also born out of 
of violence and trauma, you know, peace is not what he was born into either, just like Crawl, but he's able to recognize that saving people, what his father did, this, you know, big figure that's loomed over his life is also part of who he is. So one of the things that I love about Kirk in this story is that he's able to take that pain and all the things that happened to him in that life and able to see that the lessons that he wanted to learn from that is not, you know, go off and be angry and do all that that he was doing when he was younger, but recognize that his father's sacrifice you know, as painful as it was, it was also a positive and a good thing because people were saved, you know, 800 some lives survived because of his father. And to live up to that in a way, that's what he has to do. You know, he says saving people is what he was born into and, and it's because of his father. And so I think that story of being able to look at your past in a in an objective and honest way and learn from it and take it uh take from it what you need so that you can build that better future for yourself and for the people around you that's something that crawl is not able to do and i think it's something that kirk is able to do and it's also something that spock is able to do as well when you know at first he's like you know maybe i i have to go back to vulcan and do all these things and you know not be with aurora and back on the ship but then you know with what happens to the prime older spock he is reminded again you know from the past <laughs> that you know there is a different future for him out there he doesn't have to go off and you know do the vulcan thing um and that his future is out there you know he's reminded of that photo uh that spot uh, that older spock still has that these are the people that he's meant to be with you know, this life has meaning, that it's not just the Vulcan life that has meaning that he's supposed to be doing that because that's what, you know, people have taught him when he's a child. But this life that he chose for himself is also something that matters. And that's that future that he can go to. So I think it's a really interesting thing about using your past and learning from it, whereas crawl doesn't learn from his past and he chooses to stay in that past instead of growing beyond it but towards the end of the the film i wonder what you think about this crawl does seem to have a, a momentary kind of realization right when he's when he's sort of uh disguising himself as a sort of a pseudo baltazar right and and so he yeah. has this moment <laughs> where he thinks oh you know my i could have been different uh and he doesn't go into that he's uh, he's sort of unwilling to make that step to reconcile himself with his past to give up that pain. Uh, and he, he sort of has this kind of moment of sadness where he realizes maybe maybe he could have been different. Maybe he could have moved on into Starfleet. He's unwilling to sort of forgive himself for what he did. And he thinks that he's got to hold on to this to the end, right? So the, the, uh, part of what I wanted to ask you about in this process of thinking about moving ahead and out of trauma is uh, the, this question of forgiveness. Um, and the reason that I, I, I wanna talk about this is because one of the, the big figures that I often work with in the, in the work that I do is, is talking about the experiences of uh, uh, Desmond Tutu in South Africa dealing with the, the trauma of apartheid uh, and the creation of truth and reconciliation. Uh, the commission that allowed people to talk about their experiences with collective trauma. And for many people who have talked about this, there was a psychological process of forgiving people that had harmed them. And that this was a liberating kind of experience because it empowered them in a way. They no longer had to see themselves as victims of trauma, but as people who were learning to be able to, as the way that Tutu explains it, by forgiving you bring the person who has harmed you back into the community of humanity. Uh, uh, they are no longer, they no longer have power over you as the memory of the, the, the person who harmed you, but you can bring them back now and say, look, you did something really awful. Uh, this is not something that I'm going to forget, but I forgive you in the sense that I am no longer going to seek to harm you in revenge for the harm that you brought me. So I'm wondering whether you see forgiveness going on in the Kelvin timeline story about uh, 
uh, Crawl, Kirk, and Spock in Beyond. Is forgiveness, is there any kind of part in this? Is, is the failure of Crawl that he's unwilling to forgive himself? I think, I think it's both that, and I think it's also an element of him uh, being unable to um, be self-aware. And I, I think in order to forgive somebody, you have to be self-aware first of your needs and someone else's situation. And I think with Crawl, he was never able to be aware enough to look beyond just himself. And it was always, you know, his pain and his feelings and his view of the world. And because he's unwilling and sort of unaware and of this, this future that's beyond him, I think it is the reason that he can't forgive the Zindi, he can't forgive anybody else, he's always just angry about it, because, you know, in order to forgive someone, you kind of have to be aware of what it is that you're forgiving and what it is that you're feeling, and if you don't know what you're feeling <laughs> and what you're forgiving, you can never take that step into forgiving somebody, because then that cycle would just sort of continue because then if you don't pinpoint the problem of what is the problem, you're never gonna resolve that issue because then those feelings will always be there. And I think if you don't recognize those feelings and be aware of those feelings, you can't fix this thing that's broken. And so with Crawl, I don't think he ever understood that. And with Kirk, we have that scene where he's with the Admiral on the base um, and then they're talking about Crawl at the end. And I think Kirk recognizes that, you know, he says Crawl just got lost. And Kirk recognizes that he was starting to feel like he was going to be lost. But then he is aware now of what he's feeling and knows that, you know what, I'm not lost anymore. I found who I am and who I'm supposed to be. And I'm able to understand Crawl for what he did and why he did what he did. And I'm able to move on from that and let go of that past and let go of Crawl and sort of all that anger. And I think, you know, when, when they sort of close the files on Crawl and his crew, that is their way of letting things go. And Kirk also letting that go. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, I, I want to say that, uh, you know, thank you. This has been a really, really amazing conversation. I've really uh, seen some uh, some dimensions to these films that I, I, I don't think I really paid attention to. But in talking to you, I think that uh, uh, there's a lot more substance to the story arcs that uh, that I had never seen. Um, so question, you know, just to wrap up about the kind of analyses that you bring to Star Trek, right? On, on the Twitterverse, you're very, uh, you're very much about pointing out different kinds of political aspects of different series and, and talking about uh, uh, the way, the implications, the bigger implications of some of these storylines. Um, what would you like to be able to do with your, your advocacy in the Star Trek fandom? Like, what would you like to be able to accomplish as a Star Trek fan? Ultimately, I think what I want to accomplish is to have conversations, uh, to engender people discussing these things. And, you know, you said that you didn't really like the uh, Kelvin films, all that. Um, and, and I think I'm pretty sure, you know, there's many people that would agree with you that, you know, they didn't quite like it as well. And, and my intention with this article specifically was to get people to think about the films in a different way, um, to look at the films sort of beneath the surface of them being big blockbuster action films, but also to point out, well, there are things that, you know, maybe you didn't see the first time, or maybe you missed, or maybe you weren't really considering. And, and I think it, it's what I really want to do is just to bring a different point of view and to get people thinking about it and discussing it because I think you can learn from every Star Trek story. You know, even the ones that we don't like, we can learn something from it too. Because I think, you know, every story, every writer, when they write a story, there are things that they want to discuss and things that they want to do. And maybe sometimes they don't quite, you know, translate that story 
as well. But I think, you know, the ideas are always there. And I think it's, I just really wanted to talk about it because I felt like this was something uh, specifically for the Kelvin universe that not a lot of people were discussing. And I hadn't really seen any discussion around sort of this topic. And I always felt like so fundamental to this universe uh, and how this universe is that I think having discussions about the Kelvin films without talking about this issue is really missing a huge chunk of you know, why these films are so big and bombastic and why there's always sort of world ending implications that is also connected to sort of this theme that they're trying to uh, show to the world through these stories. So, uh, you know, what I want to do as a fan really is to kind of point out the things that maybe people didn't think about the first time and sort of remind people that yeah, they're fun action blockbusters, but there's a little bit more under the surface than, you know, people would like to give it credit for. And when people, uh, when I didn't see a lot of people talking about it, I just felt like I had to say something and bring this uh, different perspective into the conversation and saying, yeah, I mean, these films, they're also Star Trek films. You know, they, they're just looking at the world and the universe in a different way than what we might have done in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, because the way we look at the world has changed, the way we experience the world has changed. You know, the 2000s is not the 1960s. And even though some of our experiences are similar, you know, the way we look at those experiences in the world has changed. And I think the way we tell stories has changed. And I think it was just important to kind of talk about it because, you know, these these films obviously can't go into as much details as sort of the television series are able to do in 24 episodes. But I think there's also, you know, kernels of ideas and themes that they want to explore in these, you know, two hour movies that I think it's just it's important to have discussions about because I, I don't think any Star Trek story should just sort of be easily set aside because I think every story is teaching us something about the world. You know, whether we see that story or not, it's still sort of the intention. And and I think, you know, there there, there might be some hesitancy into kind of looking at it because these no new stories and these new films are done in a different way than when we're used to where you know there, there's kind of the lessons that are up front that they tell you what it is that you know it follows very much a structure but I think nowadays these stories they're not quite as obvious uh, they're not quite as you know I'm gonna make a big speech at the very beginning and we're gonna talk about these different elements and, and and I think in a way, um, these stories now are very much sort of shown and not really being told to us. And I think sometimes um, that might be a little harder for some to see what it is that a story is trying to tell when it's not in the format that we're often used to in a Star Trek story. And And I think you know, and especially in the new shows in a serialized setting, sometimes you have to see the whole story to kind of really get what it is that the story is trying to tell. And I always thought it was very interesting because um, I had, I was on, uh, I was watching a panel with a, a group of Star Trek authors and one of the authors had uh, pointed out that, you know, current Star Trek stories in the serialized format is really not that different <laughs> from uh, Star Trek stories of the past. It's just what happens in one episode in the past stories is now being stretched across an entire season. And we're learning sort of different elements as we go along. And so I, I, I think, you know, the lessons are still there. They're just kind of being parsed out in a different sort of format. And we might have to kind of reorient our brains a little to kind of uh, fit the way that they want to tell stories. And, you know, I just wanted to kind of point out to uh, people to consider that, 
you know, these sort of different themes and elements that exist in these stories and to just not, you know, cast certain things aside because, oh, you know, it might have a lot of action and, you know, space guns and pew, 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 you know, and, 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 and sort of touch upon the deeper themes that these stories are trying to convey because every story is trying to convey something or else, you know, why make a movie about it if you've got nothing to say? You know, and, and I and I think every one of the Kelvin films and every Star Trek story has that theme, has that story that they're trying to tell people. And you know, I I would agree with you that I think Into Darkness is probably the weaker of um all these Kelvin films, but I also think the Into Darkness is perhaps the one that's most relevant um, to our current times and sort of the story that it was trying to point to. And, and I think it had the most ambition uh, to tell those stories and look at it in a different way and say, yeah, you know, the, the Star Trek universe, you know, there is darkness and there is corruption and things can happen. You know, this utopia is not something that we ought to take for granted that, oh, it's just always gonna be there. The future will always be perfect you got to work for it. You, you, you got to make sure to stay vigilant and uphold the values that you're trying to, you know, spread out to the world. Yeah, I think that's right. Actually, you've made me really want to go uh, take a look again at into uh, <laughs> to, uh, in the in light of all of our conversation here. Um, no, really. Well, uh, I'm glad that's my goal. <laughs> oh, well, good. You've accomplished something then. So, well, Captain Pikachu, I, I really appreciate your time uh, with us today. Uh, I'll, uh, I hope that we can reach out to you again sometime to pick your brain about uh, uh, Star Trek and uh, maybe have you come back to talk to us a little bit about some of the newer series and see what you think about them in, in light of all of this. Uh, but thank you. Yeah. Uh, and thank you all thank you. for uh, spending some time with us, uh, listening into our conversation. Uh, you can leave us some comments down below and talk to us and let us know what you think about this topic. Uh, you can subscribe uh, to our channel and uh, look at some of our other videos in the Trek Wars at OSU series. If you're interested more in finding out about the NRA's project for alternative futures, you can find us on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and on Facebook. You can also find us at our website at anaresproject.org uh, and uh, leave us uh, some comments. Let us know what you think. Thank you, Captain. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. <laughs>